Pastor John Baird, and I want to welcome you to the Way the Word Ministries television ministry. You and I, we are moving right along down this uh, Roman road, and today we're going to look at message number uh, 55, and the title of this message is Open Arms, and we're going to be in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verses 7 through 13. And uh, you and I, we've been absolutely dedicated here in our study of the book of Romans. And we're actually coming down to the last two chapters. And uh, Paul is going to get real practical here as he speaks to those believers there in Rome back in the uh, first century, as well as uh, to you and I here in our time. And uh, one of the things that you and I need to remember as we read the book of Romans is that that uh, church there in Rome, it was made up of all different kinds of people. But one of the biggest differences uh, was the fact that some of them came from Gentile backgrounds and others came from uh, Jewish backgrounds. And yet now here they are. They're all uh, believers. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but I love to watch uh, marching bands. You usually see them come out during halftime at a football game. And speaking of football, I don't know if you ever played it or not, but if you have, then you know uh, that when the coach is diagramming a play, you're usually going to be an X or an O on that diagram. And what that means is, depending on whether you're an X or an O, well, that means there's a, a certain place that uh, you're supposed to either be or go to uh, during that play on the football field. But it's not the same thing with that marching band. Those guys are a highly developed, highly choreographed uh, show. And I don't know if you've ever seen the Ohio State marching band, but those guys are really good. One weekend I was watching TV with my two great nephews, Easton and Hayden, and we were changing channels, and we just happened to come up on halftime at the Ohio State football game, and their marching band was just coming out, and those guys were fantastic. We were highly impressed. They were so synchronized. They were all in step. But when they were done, the other team's marching band came out, and they weren't quite as good. They were a little bit out of step. And there was one guy in particular who was sometimes two and three steps out of steps. He was so messed up that the guy behind him was playing his instrument with one hand, and he kept taking his other hand and pushing this guy uh, back in a line. And then suddenly there came this time where they were all supposed to turn left. And wouldn't you know it, that guy turned right and he ran head first into the guy behind him. Well, you know, by this time I was standing up and I was over at the TV pointing the guy out to Easton and Hayden. I was saying, uh, look at this guy. It's like he doesn't know what he's doing. He's really making a mess of things. And uh, then my little nephew Easton, he said something to me that was so profound, so humbling that I still remember it to this day. He said, Uncle John, stop looking at that guy who's messing up and look at all the other guys who are doing it right. They look so cool, just like the other band did. And really, I was humbled by that. And I thought, you know what? He's right, because what I noticed was as soon as I started to focus on the people that were doing it right, my mind wasn't consumed with that one individual who was doing it wrong. And I couldn't help but think there's a great truth here uh, for the body of Christ. You see, Jesus, he left you and I, his disciples, a job to do. And the job he left us to do is uh, called the Great Commission. And that Great Commission is for you and I, us, <laughs> to make disciples out of all people everywhere. It doesn't matter who they are. Our job is to tell them the good news, to tell them the gospel. In the majority of the time, we're going to do that more with our walk than we are with our talk. Why? Because people are watching us. Most of them, 
Uh, they just want to know why we follow Jesus. Now, there's always going to be some of them who are watching us because uh, they just want us to mess up so that they can call us hypocrites or uh, something like that. It's an easy argument in any walk of life. doesn't really matter uh, what you do. Nonetheless, that's why there needs to be uh, unity among us because uh, people are watching us. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that you and I have to walk and talk like we've been uh, punched out of a machine, but the Scripture does tell us that we should be like-minded. Check this out, the book of Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, Paul says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In the body of Christ, we all have individual uh, gifts. We all play our own instrument, but we still form one big band, just like those uh, marching bands. But if we have one or two individuals who are out of step with God's word and God's will, guess who's going to get all the attention? Those one or two people that are out of step like that. But when we all work together, when we all love together, well, that's when the world sees unity in the body of Christ and they see the beauty of that unity. And that's what we want them to see because that's what Jesus wants them to see. And that's what our verses today are all about. Now, we're going to be in Romans chapter 15, verses 7 through 13. Uh, but I want to go back and look at verses 5 and 6 from our last message so we can sort of uh, foundation on those two verses as we move along. So let's dive right in. Romans chapter 15 verses 5 and 6. It says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement uh, give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and one mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now let's look at the first three of our verses for today. Romans 15, verses 7 through 9. Paul says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs, so that the Gentiles may glorify God for His mercy. So let me stop right here and sort of nutshell what Paul is saying to you and I. He's saying, hey, since Christ accepted us, well, we ought to accept each other. And now Paul is going to reach back into the Old Testament to tell us uh, some other things. And man, if there was anybody who knew the Old Testament there in the first century, it was the Apostle uh, Paul. Remember, he used to be Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee. He was a student of Gamaliel. And he was well on his way to becoming uh, the next high priest. And so again, he's going to uh, use the Old Testament scriptures, four of them actually, uh, to tell us that God has not only accepted the Jews through Jesus, he's accepted the Gentiles as well. And so uh, Paul starts out by saying, it is written. And when he says it is written, he has to be talking about the Old Testament because the New Testament isn't even in existence yet because Paul's one of the people uh, that's going to write that thing. And uh, so he says it is written. And then he goes right to Psalm 18. Check this out. Paul says, therefore, I will praise you among, and here it is, the Gentiles. Paul says, I will sing the praises of your name. Then in verse 10, Paul quotes Deuteronomy 32 and says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. That's the Jewish people. In verse 11, Paul quotes Psalm 117, 11 and says, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the people extol him. And lastly, Paul openly quotes Isaiah chapter 11 
and he starts out saying, the root of Jesse, remember Jesse is the father of David, and Jesus on his human side is of the lineage of David, and so this is about Jesus. Let's continue. Again, Paul says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. We're going to talk about two things today. The first thing we're going to talk about is acceptance, and you can underline that in whatever form you find it in in those uh, verses we just read. The other thing we're going to talk about is found in the last verse of our verses today, and let's check that out right now. Verse 13 of Romans 15, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So can you guess the other thing that we're going to be talking about today? If you said hope, well, then you are right on a target. Now, when I arrived here today, I arrived with this Band-Aid on my a finger. See, I cut myself. I was slicing the banana and I cut myself. I was slicing that banana uh, because I was going to put some peanut butter on that thing and uh, eat it. I was going to have myself a protein potassium a snack. That sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds like I'm really taking care of myself. The truth is, I just like to eat bananas with peanut butter on them. I like the way they taste. Anyway, one of the guys on the uh, crew here, uh, he said to me, Pastor John, uh, what happened to your finger? And I said, well, I was concentrating on my sermon for today and I was slicing the banana and I cut myself. And uh, he said to me, well, do me a favor, Pastor John. I said, what's that? He said, next time you slice in the banana, concentrate on the banana and uh, cut your sermon. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, you're a real encourager, like Job's wife. <laughs> I still love you, bro. Now, nonetheless, if you need acceptance and hope today, or if you want to be part of sharing acceptance and hope, well, then I'm talking to you. Let's jump in. Number one, Jesus offers acceptance. Have you been rejected? Well, Jesus offers acceptance. If there's anyone uh, within the sound of my voice who feels rejected right now or who is still uh, suffering from the pain of rejection, well, I got good news for you, the Lord Jesus is and has been standing right there in front of you with open arms saying, here I am and I will accept you. Let's look at verse seven of our verses again. Uh, Paul says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. There's a lot of believers out there who go around uh, talking about when I accepted Jesus. They'll say something like, hey, I accepted Jesus when I was 12 or I accepted Jesus when I was 17 or when I was 30 or when I was 90, whatever. Uh, but the truth is, before you ever accepted Jesus, he accepted you. Jesus accepts us, but uh, sometimes people in this world, they're going to reject us, right? Maybe when you were in elementary school, you didn't get picked to play kickball and you felt rejected. Maybe you were in high school and you asked somebody out on a date and they turned you down and you felt rejected. Maybe you asked someone uh, to marry you and they said no and you felt rejected. Maybe uh, you applied for a job and they rejected you, or maybe you were on the job and you submitted some kind of a proposal and you were hoping for advancement, but uh, you got rejected time and time again in this life. We're going to feel uh, rejection every day and in every way rejection is going on out there in this lost and fallen world. But I got good news for you. When you come to Jesus, he will never, ever reject you. He will always accept anyone who comes to him. Let me tell you how Jesus relates to sinners. Don't listen to this if you're not a sinner, okay? Now, I just know somebody, they're getting up right now, and they're going to turn off the program, or they're going to turn off the podcast, because they're going to say, I guess I don't have to listen, because as a Christian, God doesn't see me as a sinner anymore. And that's true, <laughs> but God's not blind either. He knows that over here on this side of heaven, uh, you're messing up just like the rest of us. So uh, sit back down 
And listen, letter A, how Jesus relates to sinners. Well, Jesus seeks and receives sinners. Jesus looks for sinners to receive. In fact, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2 says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man receives sinners. He welcomes them and eats with them. And you can go ahead and highlight those words, this man receives sinners. Wow, he also welcomes and eats with sinners. And I don't know about you, but I'm really glad that uh, Jesus was and still is the kind of a guy who receives sinners. Because if Jesus didn't receive sinners, he'd have never received me and he'd have never received uh, you. And the reason Jesus receives us is because he wants to do something with us. He wants to change us. Did you ever notice that in the scripture, it's always those super pious religious people who criticized Jesus, those cynics who criticized Jesus uh, for hanging around with sinners like uh, you and me. And once again, I praise God that Jesus is the kind of guy who receives sinners. Now, I have a sneaking suspicion that everyone within the sound of my voice, no matter how old they are, no matter how young they are, well, I have a suspicion, a sneaking suspicion, that every one of you wants to be accepted. The problem is a lot of people, they're scared to take that step across the threshold into acceptance. And you might ask, well, what are they scared of, Pastor John? What is it uh, that they fear? Well, uh, they fear that other people might find out about all those mistakes they made in the past or that they might see those little personality quirks that right now only they themselves and God uh, know about. And so they're scared other people uh, simply won't accept them. But let me tell you right now, Jesus knows you better than anybody. Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. He knows about every mistake you've ever made. He knows about every purposeful sin that you've ever committed. And more than that, he knows every mistake that you're ever going to make. He knows every purposeful sin that you're going to commit in the future. And Jesus says, hey, that's okay. I still love you and I accept you. Let me tell you, no one will ever, ever, ever love you more than Jesus. Hey, that's good news, but it gets even better. Not only does Jesus, letter A, seek and receive sinners, uh, but letter B, Jesus saves sinners. And what does Jesus save us from? He saves us uh, from ourselves. He saves us from an eternal destiny of separation from him. He saves us from the ultimate eternal rejection that awaits those who reject him. But He will accept you and save you if you'll allow him to. Let me give you a good example of that from the book of Luke chapter 19. Let's look at a guy by the name of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Okay, I'll stop uh, right there. Probably one of the only Sunday school songs. I still remember that one, and uh, Jesus Loves Me. I actually learned that one in the Bethel Baptist Church Sunday school when my Aunt Lula Mae uh, took me over there. I was up in the country staying with her and Uncle Jack, and we went to church that Sunday, and I learned that song in the Sunday school class there, sitting there with my uh, cousin Nancy. And at the end of the class, since I was a guest, the Sunday school teacher said, hey, uh, Johnny, do you have a song that you want to share with the class? And much to her horror, uh, I stood up and uh, sang the Hugh DePoe beer commercial. (laughs) Nonetheless, let's get back to our uh, story about Uh, Zacchaeus, Jesus, he's walking along and he sees Zacchaeus up there in that sycamore tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, come on down here. I want to go over to your house. Check this out. You'll find it in Luke 19, uh, verse 5. It says, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, that Zacchaeus. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for today. I must stay at your house. Now, so far, I've kind of made Zacchaeus sound like a a cuddly kind of a little fairy tale 
a character, but let me tell you the uh, truth from the true account uh, about Zacchaeus, just what he really was. Zacchaeus was a wicked, white-collar criminal. Zacchaeus was an extortionist. He cheated people out of their money. Nonetheless, when Jesus saw him up there in that sycamore tree, he didn't point his finger and say, Zacchaeus, you're a self-centered a robber. No, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't accuse Zacchaeus. Jesus called Zacchaeus. Jesus said to Zacchaeus, come on down here, Zacchaeus. I want to go over to your house. And what Jesus was really saying was, Zacchaeus, I want to have a personal relationship with you. And you know what, Zacchaeus? I think once you get to know me, well, you're going to want to have a personal relationship with me Two, one of the biggest misconceptions going on out in the world today when it comes to salvation is uh, people think that they've got to uh, clean up their life uh, before they can come to Jesus. But the truth is, if you wait to clean up your life before you come to Jesus, you're never going to come uh, to Jesus because you can't clean your life up on your own. You don't have the power to do that. You've got to come to Jesus just as you are. You've got to come as a sinner and then you've got to let Jesus clean you up. You've got to let Jesus change you. Let's take another look at Zacchaeus here. After they were done having dinner, Zacchaeus told everybody, he said, hey, look, I'm a changed man, not because Jesus called me down out of that tree, uh, but because Jesus came and he spent time with me and I got to know him. Look what Zacchaeus says here in Luke 19, verse 8. It says Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. There are a lot of Zacchaeuses out there in the world today. One might be in the gutter. Another might hold the highest office in the land. But they're still stuck up there in their tree of pride, in their tree of unbelief. But Jesus, he's uh, calling their names and he's saying, I want to get to know you and I want you to get to know me. Jesus is telling them, I'll accept you just the way you are. I'll receive you. And if they'll come down out of their tree, and uh, they'll meet Jesus and get to know him. Well, guess what? Uh, Jesus will change them too, just like he changed Zacchaeus, just like he changed me, and just like he changed many of you. Now, wherever you're at today, watching or listening, if there's uh, somebody that's uh, sitting next to you, I want you to look them in the eye and I want you to tell them Jesus loves you just the way you are. And if you believe that, say amen. Now, I'm sure whoever you uh, told that to was grateful to hear it. But the truth is, uh, you haven't told them the whole truth uh, yet. I want you to look back at that person and I want you to say, Jesus loves you just the way you are. But he also loves you too much to leave you just the way you are. In other words, when a person comes to Jesus just as they are, as a, a sinner, a Jesus accepts them. He loves them uh, just as they are, but they can't stay uh, the way they are once they've committed themselves uh, to the bond of Jesus' love. Because Jesus didn't come just to seek and receive sinners. Uh, Jesus came to save and change uh, sinners. So again, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice who's experienced the pain of rejection, well, uh, give it to Jesus uh, because he is doing everything he can. Remember, he's the God of this world. He's the creator of every good and perfect gift, and he's doing everything he can to let you know that he will never reject you, that he will accept you if you'll come to him. And so that's the first thing I wanted to talk about today, acceptance. And like I said, the next thing that I want to talk to you about today is hope. Let's look at verse 13 of our verses again. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's so much in that a verse, but again, we're going to focus on that word hope, H-O-P-E. The God of hope wants you and I to overflow with hope, and that's number two. Jesus offers hope. 
Are you unsure about the future? Well, Jesus offers hope. He offers hope. But the problem is most people out there, they don't know what the word hope means. So today, what I'm going to do is show you a contrast uh, between what hope means out there in the world of secular humanism and what hope means in the body of Christ. Let's dive in. Letter A, in the world of secular humanism, hope means it might happen. It might happen or it might not happen. That's what the word hope means uh, from a worldly point of view. Remember back when you were in school? I don't know. Maybe you still are in school. You had to take that a big test and you'd say, I hope I pass this test. Or maybe you're a sports fan and you say, I hope my uh, sports team wins the big game. You get the idea. A lot of young people, they say, I hope I meet someone who wants to marry me. In fact, back in the old days with girls anyway, not so much uh, boys, but uh, girls used to have this thing they called a hope chest. And so when they were growing up, that hope chest, it could have been a cabinet or a little box or maybe a chest at the foot of their uh, bed. But what they would do is they'd put little mementos and keepsakes in there uh, for the future. And uh, then when they got married, well, they'd pull that hope chest out and they'd bring those things out to decorate and adorn uh, their new life with their uh, new husband. But as they were growing up, every time they put something in that hope chest, uh, they were saying, hey, I hope someday I get married and I hope I get married to a good man. That's why it was called a hope chest. Now, uh, in the last chapter of the book of Genesis, we find Joseph is still in Egypt and he's dying. And he has his brothers gather around him and he makes them swear an oath uh, that when they finally do come into the promised land, the land that was promised to the patriarchs, their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Joseph makes his brothers swear an oath that uh, they'll come back down here to Egypt, get his bones and carry them up there and rebury them in the promised land. Check this out. You'll find it in the book of Genesis chapter 50 verses 24 through 26. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. And when you look at that last verse there and you see that word a coffin, I want you to understand it's the only time in the Bible uh, that the word coffin is ever uh, used. It's used right there in the Old Testament. And in the Hebrew, uh, the word for a coffin is the word aron, and it literally means hope chest. Now, you all have heard me say before what is in the Old Testament concealed is in the New Testament Revealed. I didn't write that or come up with that, uh, but it's an absolutely true statement. In this case, uh, Joseph's hope was that his brothers would come back and get his bones and carry them up to the promised land. Well, uh, that's a concealed hope that's revealed later in the New Testament. It's revealed in the promise of the rapture of the church. And you'll find that in the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Paul says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of humankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Joseph's hope was that once the Israelites came into the promised land, well, they'd come back down there to Egypt and they'd get his bones, take them back up to the promised land and rebury them there. And that's just what they did. They fulfilled their oath uh, to Joseph. Well, it's the same thing for you and I as believers. One day uh, we're going to hear the call of God and then the bones and the ashes, the remains, no matter what shape they're in, of everyone of the faithful is going to rise up in the rapture of the church to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to experience what's known as the bodily resurrection. Man, that's not just a hope. That's a promise uh, from God. And that's also a great uh, segue for you and I from letter A. Hope in the world of secular humanism means it might happen to uh, letter B. Hope in the body of Christ means it will happen. If you ask somebody, are you going to go to heaven when you die? And they give you some mealy mouth answer like, I hope so. Well, your pat answer back to them should be, hey, the Bible, the word of God says uh, you can know so. Why? Because our hope as followers of Jesus is certain and sure. Uh, look with me in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Look what Paul said to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. He said, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so a good biblical definition of the word hope would be positive expectation. Hey, I'm expecting it to happen and I'm positive it's going to happen because the scripture says it's going to happen. Many of you uh, may have heard of the Roman philosopher uh, Cicero. He's the one that made that famous statement, while there's life, there's hope. And a lot of people out there in that secular humanist world, well, they'd agree uh, with that statement. I mean, you go up to one of them and, and you say, hey, how you doing? They always got these cool things they say, right? They say like, oh, I'm still breathing, right? Or they'll go, I still got a pulse. Or I woke up on this side of the dirt this morning. In other words, where there's life. Uh, there's hope. As a chaplain, I've been involved in many emergency room uh, situations. I've been on many of what are called code blues. These are all life and death situations. And at the end of those things, if the uh, patient is still alive, a lot of times the, the doctor will uh, say to that patient's loved ones, well, it doesn't look good. Uh, but they're still holding on. Their uh, vital signs are starting to get a, a little bit stronger. And all that person's loved ones can uh, uh, think is, well, uh, uh, there's life, uh, so there's still hope. But I want to tell you, man, life is about so much more than just uh, 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 living and breathing over here on uh, this side of heaven. Uh, look what James said in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 14, about our earthly lives. He said, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. But the scripture teaches us that life itself is eternal. Everybody gets eternal life. The big question is always the same. Where are you going to spend it, heaven or hell? And the answer to that question is based on the choice that you and I make as to whether or not uh, we're going to accept or reject something, as to whether or not we're going to accept or reject Jesus. That's why the scripture uh, teaches the opposite of where there's life, there's hope. Instead, God's word teaches us where there's hope, uh, there's life. Because it's your hope that gives strength uh, to your life. That's why Colossians 1.27 says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this uh, mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So where and in whom is your hope? If it's in this physical life itself or the temporary things of this lost and fallen world, then it's no hope 
at all. There's so much hopelessness out in the world today because people don't see a way out. They condemn themselves as individuals and then compromise with the things of this fallen world. And all they find is rejection after rejection. But if you've given your life to Jesus, then he has come to live in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. That's not something that might have happened. That's something that absolutely has happened. And so as believers, since our faith is in Jesus and our hope is in God's word, we can boldly proclaim wherever we go. I am not uh, rejected because where there's hope, there's life. Until the next time you and I meet here on the Way the Word television program, may God bless you, may God keep you, and may God grant you the desires of your heart, all in Jesus' mighty name. Until then, I'll see you later, everybody.